Hola y bienvenidos a todos. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Michelle Garcia Dormany, and it's an honor to be here today and serve as the moderator for such an amazing panel of inspirational Latin leaders from the automotive and tech industries. But before we begin, I'm delighted to have TrueCar's Chief People Officer, John Foster, also here with us today, who will provide us with some opening remarks. John? Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm John Foster. I'm Chief People Officer at TrueCar. Um, and before we begin today's panel, I'd just like to take a moment to personally thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's an important conversation. Um, we're here to celebrate Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month and recognize and celebrate the stories and achievements of so many members of our Hispanic and Latinx community uh, within the automotive industry. And we want to shine a light on these great people um, because oftentimes we don't get a chance to, to recognize people for, for this particular uh, background. In addition to today's panel, we've also held other events this year focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, including celebrations for Black history, women's history, um, AAPI, Jewish Heritage, and Pride Months. The effort to be more inclusive and to ensure equity in and around our business is a journey. Uh, we're committed to moving forward consistently and with integrity. So this is also an opportunity for us to have an open and honest dialogue about challenges that might still remain. So we can both celebrate and identify uh, some of the paths that forward that we need to take. We believe gatherings like this are integral uh, to creating an environment that's fair and equitable for everyone. So we're going to use TrueCar as a platform to create open dialogue and create spaces where we can safely talk about difficult questions and learn from each other's perspectives. Again, a sincere thank you to all of you for joining us today. On behalf of all of us at TrueCar, I'd like to wish you a very happy and insightful Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. And now I'll send it back over to you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Appreciate that warm opening. I'd also like to give an extra special thanks to TrueCar for not only allowing this conversation to take place, but also for encouraging it. And without further ado, I'd like to bring on our panelists. Uh, welcome Fernando Varela, Chairman of National Association of Minority Auto Dealers and President of All Star Motors. Liza Sanchez, General Manager and Managing Partner of Alpine Buick C South. David Mondragon, VP of Enterprise Product Development at IHS Market. Susan Shilgaitan, Director of Dealer Training at Allen Rams Proactive Solutions. And Hernan Tagliani, Multicultural Marketing Executive, President of the Group Advertising and International Marketing Professor at University of Central Florida. Welcome everyone. And now I'd like to invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Uh, we'll start with you, Fernando. If you can, please let us know about your ethnicity background and your journey in automotive. Thanks, Michelle. Glad to be on uh, part of this uh, unique uh, live stream. Uh, Fernando Varela, uh, born in Bogota, Colombia, um, and uh, been a Ford dealer for about 27 years. Um, I started uh, as a dealer here in East Texas uh, to the Ford Minority Dealer Development Program that allowed me the opportunity to uh, become a dealer. Um, and I love what I do and I love the auto industry on it. Thank you. Liza? Muy buenas tardes o días, dependiendo donde están. Thank you for including me with these great people. Um, my parents are originally from Chihuahua, Mexico. I am born here, but of course, um, grew up in our culture, and I started in the business um, through college. I was doing an internship in marketing, and that's how I was introduced to the auto industry. Fantastic. Welcome. Yes. Dave? Great. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so. My uh, grandparents came to the U.S. from Mexico. Uh, they came in from Mexico City and uh, moved to Arizona uh, and then eventually ended up in California. Uh, my family is big. I have nine kids in my family, so we have a big family. And as we know, you know, family and food and, uh, and, and experiential activities are a big part of the Hispanic culture and community. And, and we participate greatly in that space. I worked for Ford Motor Company for 32 years before I joined IHS uh, three years ago. And uh, so I've got a lot of history at retail with dealers and then with operational experience with the company. And so we can share some of those, uh, some of those experiences as well. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Hernan? 
Hi everybody, or buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Hernán Tagliani, soy uh, presidente de la agencia de Group Advertising. Uh, he nacido en Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, más de 30 años de experiencia. Oh, everything in Spanish now. Everybody's like, what the heck is he talking about, right? No, no, no. So no, I love been... it. <laughs> we have to break the ice, right? We have to break the ice. So no, my name is Fernando Tagliani. I was born and raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, I work in marketing and advertising for over 30 years. Uh, 10 years in Latin America, 20 years in the United States. And my experience working with the automotive uh, started at a young age. Uh, uh, working with uh, uh, different uh, automotive brands in Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, working at the same time with dealerships uh, in Latin America. And then 20 years ago, when I moved here to the United States, I had the honor to work with some of the luxury automotive brands uh, through a car dealership and directly with corporate office. So I'm excited to be here and thank you for having me. Thank you. And Susan? Hola, mi gente, mi raza. Es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. Uh, I, I had to follow her down on that. So um, I am a dreamer. I was born in El Salvador. I came at a very young age. My mom is salvadoreña. My dad is guatemalteco. I obviously do not look like I am Hispanic. And so it's a little uh, secret I tend to keep in my pocket and pull out when I need to sometimes. But um, I am so excited to be here with you guys. I am honored, really. I've heard a lot about you. I spent 23 years in the automotive retail space, started answering phones for a Lexus dealership. And um, my Spanish really was what catapulted me into other directions quickly. Uh, there was a need. There was a big, big, big need. And um, here I am. I am not uh, working in a showroom anymore. I am uh, a bilingual trainer for Alan Rams Proactive Training Solutions. So I have the pleasure of visiting dealerships I've worked with. A couple hundred plus dealerships, um, including Spanish ones. And so I, I get to have some insights on what's going on within the dealership, which is, which is great. So that's a little bit about me. I'm going to hand it back to Michelle. Um, so again, happy to be here. Thank you all. And uh, also a quick introduction um, on, on my end. Uh, so I am the uh, daughter of immigrants. My father is from Cuba with Spanish heritage. My mother is from Mexico with Mexican and Chinese heritage. Uh, I grew up off Calle Ocho, so old school Miami. Uh, I was an ESOL kid, so English is my second language, and uh, first gen college grad uh, with a finance degree. And I, I started my career in automotive at, on the OEM side at Porsche Cars North America and I moved towards tech as my career progressed. Now working at TrueCar as VP of Consumer Experience Strategy and serving as executive sponsor to our Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month efforts, which leads us to this wonderful panel today. So thank you all again for being here. And as John mentioned in his remarks, this is an important conversation we're having here today. We're here first to celebrate our achievements within automotive, but also to discuss the road ahead and in our industry and beyond. Um, according to the latest census data, the, the Hispanic Latinx community makes up about 19% of the U.S. population and accounts for more than half of the country's population growth in the last decade. Yet there are only 3% of chief executives in the S&P 500 that are Hispanic Latin. And among all the board seats in the S&P 500, only 5% are held by Hispanic Latinx. Latinas are 18% of the US female population, but are only 1% of Fortune 500 board seats, the least of any gender or ethnic group. So the reality is that representation of our community in executive positions in corporate panels or corporate boards is really, uh, it pales in comparison to the, you know, our share of the U.S. population. Um, and we see that as well in the automotive space. So, so with that, I'd like to start off the discussion with, you know, this underrepresentation, not only in automotive, but, you know, throughout business and, and ownership and executive management positions, uh, where, when comparing it to, you know, purchasing power and population, why do y'all think this is? And, and what do you think we could do to fix it? Um, Fernando, I'd like, I'd like to start with you. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, I think part of our issues probably, it goes back to the, maybe the stigma that being in the car industry has. A lot of people refer to used car salesmen and things like that. No matter if you sell new or used car, if you work for a factory or something like that. So I don't think the automobile industry has done a good job going back into uh, colleges and high schools and, and 
and show uh, what a good job a person can do if they take a career in the auto industry. So in my opinion, we haven't done, we did it for a while years ago, 15, 20 years ago, where we pushed college universities to uh, to highlight more of the uh, of the auto industry careers. On it. If you look at companies like Tesla today, uh, those those companies are going to hire people who tell them they're more into a high tech company than a car company, and they're actually getting some good talent to work for them. I think the other traditional auto companies probably need to do a better their job, in my opinion, getting uh, young people to get into our industry. That there is a that there is an industry that is a good way to make a living. And it's more respectful than, than what people think it is. Those are good points. Um, Liza, I think you also had a, a few comments that you'd like to share with us. Well, I believe that across the board, this is an issue with all minorities. And I don't think it's necessarily because we are minorities. I think because the auto industry ownership is very generational. It's passed on you know, from parents to you know, children. And I think that's the main reason. The owners that I've met that are minorities have either gone through a minority program, um, but at that point, you really don't know about it until you're kind of in an executive position, or it's been passed on because the family no longer is interested, so then you're able to buy into it. Um, and I think I agree with Fernando. Um, we really don't know about careers in the auto industry myself i never knew anything about it being a really good career like i said i i fell into it uh doing an internship where i needed it on air time in order to be um doing broadcasting or journalism and i realized that i had a passion for it right and as i grew in the business i found out maybe about six years into it that there was an opportunity through gm to be able to you know, own a dealership to be able, and, and to me being, you know, a woman and then Hispana, pues, it's like double fold of, you know, it's super hard to do. But the opportunities that are out there, I think we just have to do a better job of letting people know that they are. Because I think Hispanics are in every single industry. It's more about, you know, that one person that kind of pushes you along and says, hey, you could do this. Tienes una oportunidad. Yeah, mm -hmm. that sponsor, if you will. Uh, Dave, what, what are your thoughts? So it's a, it's an interesting question because I think um, it's two pronged. It's 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 OEM and how do we get more Hispanics uh, into the C-suite for OEMs, uh, and then it's retailers, dealers. So I think there's two parts of the uh, the question to really address. For the OEMs, you know, as we know, the the at least the traditional OEMs. Um, they've been uh, white dominated, they've been male dominated. Uh, and just over the last decade, we've seen more females break through that barrier. I've seen more females and we've read about more females taking C-suite positions uh, at a lot of the OEMs and their influence is really opening the door for a lot more of the discussion around diversity and inclusion. Uh, we've seen uh, minorities start to take more prominent positions as well over the last couple of decades but there's still a huge opportunity to expand. I, Fernando touched on, you know, where you fish is the key. You got to fish in the right ponds to start to attract the right people into the organization. And the organization has to be committed to having a, a diverse employee base. So the OEMs, it, it's a big opportunity for them to leverage uh, and embrace community, especially a Hispanic community that represents over a trillion dollars of spending. It represents 17% of the industry sales. Uh, and if you look at the makeup of the consumers to come, you know, 44 percent of Hispanics are under the age of 45. So if the opportunity isn't now to start embracing those customers, they're going to lose customers for many years down the road. And the best way to, to start to attract and retain those customers is having people within the company that appreciates and understands the culture, the language, the diversity. There's 22 different uh, um uh, Hispanic languages and 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 uh, cultures in the U.S. So you know it's Cuban, it's it's Dominican, it's uh, it's Puerto Rican, it's Mexican. They all have different languages, they, they, different dialogue. They have different um, they have uh, different cues. So you, it's not one size fits all as well. And you have to understand that and be able to market to that. On the retail side, there needs to be more energy and more support. Fernando got in. He mentioned dealer development. Those programs have basically dried up. 
Uh, his work at NAMAD is invaluable because they really help represent the face of the dealers, but they need more money. They need more support financially. The multiples today are too high for a lot of dealers, especially individual entrepreneurs that are Hispanic based to be able to afford to get in. So there needs to be lending institutions that support it and the OEMs need to drive a much more active footprint to help grow that business. So um, I think there's opportunity, but you know, with that uh, comes some commitment and, uh, and devotion with regard to funding. Well, well said. And Hernan, did you have some comments as well? Yeah, no, no, I agree with it. <clears throat> With the panelists, I think that as you well said in the beginning, you know, uh, Michelle, uh, America is becoming more diverse and multiracial than ever before. I'm not just saying that, the census is saying that. Uh, Hispanics represented over 51.7% of US population growth over the past 10 years, while white Americans declined 6%. And the census is talking about why decline for three reasons. Number one is the lack of uh, birth rate, increase of death, and low immigration. So the questions that uh, corporations need to start asking is, how do you see yourself in the next five to 10 years? Because the market is shifting and evolving at a really fast pace. Um, so in the end, as a car dealer, you have, or as an automotive brand, you have to represent the community you serve. So, uh, and it's not just about hiring and returning uh, employees and performance, you know, increasing their performance to sell more cars, it's also the external challenge that uh, automotive brands and dealerships need to start asking. It is great to have minority employees in your team, but what do you do as a brand, uh, number one, to impact the community of these employees that are part of your team and they represent? How do you make them feel proud that they're part of your dealership um, as you're impacting their communities? How many contracts have you granted to minority-owned business to fulfill the, the, fulfill the mission and vision of your corporation. So uh, diversity and inclusion is always uh, seen as an internal challenge, but it's time for brands to start thinking as an external. Uh, I think it's both ways. And I strongly believe, I, I, I feel very optimistic about the future as more and more millennials, as the census is talking about, that more than 53% of consumers 18 years old and younger are multicultural. Once we start seeing millennials into executive positions, uh, challenging the status quo, uh, that's when really we're gonna see that change. Um, so that's, that's my feedback, you know, is uh, stop thinking about today, you know, how many cars are you gonna sell today? Start having a plan and accordingly that society has changed and evolves and you need to have, uh, you know, a, a plan and a strategy in, in, in place to assure that sustainability and growth as a business and as a brand. Absolutely, and and you know I love how you all have started to touch in, uh, touch on especially around this industry particularly, you know, and how how the automotive and tech industries could be looking at this this uh, this community of of people. Um, you know, Susan, what are your thoughts in terms of how the industry? You know, why should the industry care? Uh, sorry for the background noise. I'm at Digital Dealer, but um, I, you know, listen, I, I, all of you guys brought up so many great points. 19% of the population is what we represent today, but in our industry, we represent 24% of car buyers. So there is definitely a need. We're buying a lot of cars. Um, you know, the future is, is, is great. I, I believe that if you miss this boat, um, you know, speaking very frankly, you might be losing profit. You might be, you know, if you really are looking to sustain your profits for the future, for future years and decades, uh, and you have, you've done the research and you know that you have uh, an audience, a, a, a wide Hispanic demographic, in your area, then this is a must. And just honing in on this, on these future buyers will definitely sustain and, and, and uh, provide exponential, exponential growth and profit. So I think for, from a business standpoint, 
um, you're going to lose money if you don't get your act together and do something about it now to attract more Hispanic buyers and influencers into your business. Absolutely. Uh, any additional remarks or comments from, from the other panelists? I, I just think Dave made a, a, a real good point that this is coming from minority more than uh, you know, we're past to this table. I'm sorry, Susan. Would you mind muting really quick? I think uh, it's it's tough to hear, Fernando. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, would yeah. you mind uh, repeating that? Well, I, I made a comment that they I made a, a valid point on it, that the price of entry nowadays to the auto industry, especially to the retail side of it, it's so huge that uh, minorities, Hispanics being the last ones to the table, is becoming almost unreachable for us to, to, uh, to have that dream. So the industry will have to start coming out with different ways how to invest in the future to allow these minorities to become part of their, uh, you know, part of their they're mixed. Yeah, I, I would add a couple of things as well. I, I think, um, you know, the Hispanic Chamber, Hispanic Auto Dealer Association, I think they could actually put more leverage and more pressure on the industry to start to grow the footprint. I think NAMAD does the best job. They're the most active. Um, but the the uh, the Hispanic organizations need to step up and they need to, to really make a point. If not, you know, I think um, somebody just said that, that you know, profit, you're going to miss profit. This is a huge opportunity as you look at it. You know, the, the country in the U.S. will be minority white in 2045. So that's 20 years away. Uh, and Hispanics will continue to be the number one uh, demographic in the U.S. at that point. They'll grow to be, um, continue to be that. But if you look at what's happening today, um, we just said Hispanics are, are a huge part of the population. Uh, they represent 17% of all the sales, automotive sales on the new side, not the used side, the use, the new side, but less than 2% of the dealerships are owned by Hispanic dealers. Uh, and the reason why that's important, well, let me give you one more stat. If eight states in the U.S., uh, you know those states, Arizona, California, Florida, Illinois, uh, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, and Texas, they represent 90% of the Hispanic population in the U.S., and they also represent 1.7 million sales. So 1.7 million sales to Hispanics in those states alone. The representation in those states, and Fernando's in one of those states in Texas, we only have 5% Hispanic dealers. Now, why is it important for an OEM to actually want more Hispanic dealers? It's because they, they serve their community better than anyone else. 25% of the sales from a Hispanic dealer uh, go to other Hispanics. 25%, that's double the rate of a non-Hispanic dealer. It's the highest in the industry. Um, I've got data that shows Asian dealers sell 7% of their vehicles to other Asians. African-American uh, dealers sell 11% of their vehicles to African-Americans, but Hispanic dealers, because they know the culture, uh, they know the language they, and they embrace the community, they sell nearly 25% of their sales to that community. So the, if you wanna grow your sales in this community, you need to add more dealers. And if you add more dealers, dealers like Fernando will show that they can overserve the community and they can help the OEM grow their business, grow their share, and actually make more money as a result of that. But, I, but attract this customer that's young and will be here for many years. Hispanics are unbelievably brand loyal. They'll be here for many years down the road. If you lose them now, you might never get a chance to attract them back to your brand again. So just yeah. that. I agree with Dave 100%. It's not a matter of you cannot afford doing Hispanic outreach. It's how much money are you leaving on the table by not embracing this change. So I always ask, I'm not asked, I've always said, I'm not asking you for more money on investing in marketing. What I'm asking you is reallocating your marketing dollars on those areas of growth. If you are in a market like Miami, where 68% Miami for Florida Day is Hispanic, and you do zero Hispanic market, definitely you're reaching just 30 percent of the audience. So uh, in the end, is that is look at the market, represent the community you serve, and reallocate your marketing dollars accordingly to those areas of growth. Hundred uh, percent. Lisa, did you have a few comments? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I could attest to um, what you guys are saying as far as uh, the footprint to Hispanics. I mean, since I started day one in the auto industry, we've been marketing directly um, through with Hispanics, um, through TV, through radio, through every possible way. Um, and I think that's a large part of our success. We opened a second store in 2018, and within the first year, we grew it by 200%. And, and I think it has, it, it has to do with the fact that we have a very loyal following. Um, we all know us, our Hispanics are so loyal to the brand and to uh, the people. You know, they will follow you to wherever they have to follow you. Um, we have two stores, our Alpine Buick GMC in Denver and Alpine Buick GMC in South. And we are both number one and two in our district. So super successful and I think it has to do with, I know it has to do with our Hispanic influence. Great, and and I believe Fernando touched on this too around recruiting, uh, you know, the, the Hispanic Latinx talent and working more closely with colleges and universities to do that. Uh, are there any other thoughts on how we could potentially recruit and attract, retain, uh, you know, this diverse talent into our industry? Um, Susan, let's start with you. Yeah. So already so many great ideas, Spanish organizations, business organizations, charities, uh, radio stations. I mean, uh, there are so many social media, you know, you really social media is a great platform to leverage for uh, recruiting and attracting those people. Um, but, you know, when I think about how to retain those people. Obviously, we know that most of these Hispanics are younger. They've got years, decades of car buying to do. Uh, and so, you know, really retaining these centers of influence. It's so important to have Hispanic leadership within your organization because they will be uh, the future centers of influence. And like Liza mentioned, we like referrals. We, we give referrals. We live on referrals. We talk. When you treat me right, when you portray to me, when you make me feel like I am important. And, you know, listen, we've all felt that um, exclusivity, right? Uh, feeling like a, a resident alien, you know, that, you know, we might not belong here. And so when we experience as a consumer, someone treating us with open arms and uh, respecting and admiring our culture, we are going to talk about it and you will, we will refer people to you. So, you know, number one, it's important to attract these future leaders because those will be the centers of influence. Uh, but, you know, one thing I've, I've noticed at, at dealerships, for example, that there's a huge disconnection um, when, you know, there's dealerships who understand this growth and perhaps it's, a marketing company that's directing them, you know, telling them, listen, this is your future market and you need to put this much money into this. Uh, but there are so many steps after that that I have found in my working with these dealerships that are missed. For example, I did a case study of my own. So I'm gonna be speaking here about Hispanic heritage, how to in include your Hispanic, his, sorry, Hispanic market uh, for profits. But, um, one of the things is ensuring that you are, once you're advertising and attracting those leads or those shoppers or those potential shoppers to your organization, make sure that your landing page is set up so, to welcome these guys. I did a little case study in my area where um, I, I, I Googled, literally, I pretended to be a Spanish buyer and I Googled ventas de carros Toyota in my area. Uh, which, by the way, Ventura County is 43% uh, Hispanic. So I Googled and one of the top ads was a, a large dealership I'm not going to mention, but um, they are specifically in an area of this county that is 73.4% uh, Hispanic. And so I clicked on the website, one of the top ones, and once I got there, there was nothing there to retain me. So there was no se habla español, there was, there was a chat box, but nothing in Spanish. Uh, and so are your landing pages retaining these, these, these potential shoppers? Uh, what about your phone system? If they were to call you up, do you have an option for Spanish? Do you have a Spanish receptionist? 
Do you have a Spanish speaking staff? Do you have collateral at your dealership? What are you doing to retain these shoppers? I think, you know, I'm noticing that people are starting to get it. Okay, Hispanics are a future. We need to put money into that. But it's retaining is a is a completely different thing. So I think that that's there's a huge disconnection there. I think a lot of focus needs to shift to ensure that we keep these people here. Because again, if we like you, we're going to send everyone there. We're going to send our tia, our tío, our abuelito, our uncle, our cousin, everyone. So, you know, those I feel are, 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 are small things that are critical to retain the Hispanic consumer. Great points. And Dave, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, especially in the OEM and uh, tech side in terms of the, that talent retention and traction. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it, it's really a complex question because, you know, it, 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 when I was with an OEM, we um, started to recruit at different schools. Our traditional recruiting schools were in Northwestern, Harvard, uh, uh, Penn State, Michigan, Michigan State, Cal. And uh, quite frankly, you know, Fernando said, you got a fish in the pond where the fish are biting. The Hispanics aren't, you know, we don't have a lot of density in those areas. They're not high density states. And so we had to start to course correct the schools we recruited at. We had to go to Fresno State, University of Texas in San Antonio. We had to go to Miami University. Uh, and then we started to actually start to speak to the right audience. The next challenge, though, is to actually get them to be willing to leave their family, their culture, and come to a place like Detroit, which doesn't have any of that. And so you had Stellantis, GM, and Ford. You know, that's that's my my history is with the big three. It's difficult to get somebody to leave California or Florida and move there and lose a lot of that socialization of their cultural history because there's just not a lot of it there. They they have to bring it and then they have to help instill it within the companies. And I think the companies are starving for that. They would love to have more diversity. And so it's a huge opportunity for people to do that. We just as an industry, we need to figure out how to communicate that opportunity for them, bring them on and then leverage them and let them grow and, and flourish. I, I, I mentioned earlier when we when we had a pre-call, I grew up in a very humble family and uh, my parents spoke Spanish, but they never spoke Spanish to the kids. And so I didn't learn Spanish. When you're speaking Spanish on this show, I'm a little embarrassed because I'm half Mexican uh, and I can't speak Spanish. And the reason why is because my father who grew up in the 40s and the 50s, he had a lot of discrimination and he was he was hell bent on ensuring that we were as Anglo as possible so we could fit into a company like Ford. He had to fit into a company like AT&T. And so to do that, we read we didn't speak Spanish in the home. We read books like Dress for Success. Uh, we changed the pronunciation of my last name from Mondragon or from Mondragon to Mondragon because it was more Anglo, it was easier pronounced. And, you know, that that to me, um, quite frankly, as I look back, it was a disservice to the culture and to even myself and my family. Um, but at the time when I joined a company in Detroit, you had to fit in uh, because if you wore your diversification on your shoulder back in the in the 80s, you weren't going to make it through the organizational structure. So a lot has changed. Everybody's embracing diversity. Uh, so today is the right time. The industry is ripe. For it, for integrating and uh, bringing cultural relevance to their to their company, and they want to do that. So now it's just a matter of attracting them and bringing them in and retaining. Thank you so much for sharing that story, Dave. I mean, that's something I think a lot of resonates with a lot of folks, including myself. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. Same here. Thank you. That was yeah, yeah. It, it, it was touching, and I appreciate that you said that because, like I said, I think. Again, sometimes we feel like we don't belong, you know, and, and we try to assimilate and we lose some of that. But um, I've been there, too. Again, all of these things are, you know, paying attention to all these little things, uh, Michelle. And I'm sorry, but I want to go back to what I was saying, because making sure that you're setting up your organization for success in those ways will attract those uh, yeah. leaders, the right yeah. leadership. Yeah. Hernan, you... Did you have something you wanted to comment? Yeah, no, no, I agree with uh, with Susan. You know, uh, something to highlight uh, when you want to be successful with Hispanic market, it is important to highlight that culture is more important than language. And I have seen over and over uh, many times of uh, you know uh, 
seen websites of car dealers, they use Google Translate, which is a terrible, terrible way of translating your website. Just do a, a quick uh, a quick sample, just grab something in English, put it on Google, translate into Spanish, and then grab the Spanish, translate it back into English. You will see how bad it is. So you need to make sure that your content is culturally relevant, that appeal to the cultural nuances of the audience you have to serve. Because in the end, what is going on right now in marketing, as a marketing experts, we're shifting away from a transactional marketing from the 80s to the 90s to a brand experiential. This is what millennials are asking for and they are looking for. They care less about owning and possessing material things. It's all about the experience. It's all about the journey. It's all about how you make them feel. So understanding the culture um, and, and embracing it uh, is in the end what is going to make you uh, very successful. So two important things. You need to be open and willing to embrace change. That those cultural differences is in the end what is going to make you stronger as a brand and as a person. And number two, you have to be committed. Uh, you know, uh, I have seen it over and over. Brands, the Hispanic Heritage Month is a great example to talk about Hispanic heritage, but then they are quiet throughout the year. This should be an ongoing effort. Uh, this is where the growth is coming. This is uh, a way for you to assure sustainable growth. Um, so make them feel welcome in your dealership, target to them, uh, reallocate your marketing dollars to those areas of growth. And, um, and I guarantee you, you're gonna have a very successful future uh, if you take the time to uh, learn about those consumers that you serve, because, you know, we can be in the market, you can be a very successful dealership and you have been in the market since 1960. But in the end, if you have never communicated to them, don't assume they know what you're all about. Susan and I, we can be neighbors and live across the street one from another and say, hey, Susan, hey, Herman. But if I don't take the time to get to know Susan and invite her to my house, have a few drinks and get to know her, I cannot say that I know everything about Susan because we are neighbors for 20 years. So this is just a little example uh, of uh, things that I wanted to point out that I see on a daily basis, which is breaking the ice and that stereotype of what Hispanics is all about. 80% uh, of the Hispanic community is US born, second, third generation, bilingual, bicultural. It's not the people are crossing the border and, and taking jobs from uh, Americans as uh, some some people think about it. only one third one third of the u.s hispanic population is foreign born 80 percent of u.s population is uh u.s born and so you talked a little bit about you know being hispanic latinx and the advantages and benefits that there are in you know may, many of them sometimes i'm unseen uh i'd love to hear you know what uh maybe fernando has to think about about that specifically you know, Michelle, a couple of things. One, obviously, the the marketing to the Hispanic community is very difficult. Uh, unlike any other cultures, you know, African Americans or uh, Liberty So when you're dealing marketing to the Hispanic community and, and listening to what Susan and Erna has to say, uh, what what happened Hispanic in Texas not necessarily the same thing that happened Hispanic in Florida. Uh, so you got to really understand that that's very difficult for for a company uh, to really take a paint brush approach and market the same way to all the Hispanics across the United States. And that thing, that's what's happening and failing nowadays because they want to take a, a paint brush approach to it. Um, you know, Susan in, in Texas, in some areas in Texas, Hispanics do not search in Hispanic websites. They go to strictly English websites. And like Hernan says, most of the uh, Hispanics in the United States are born here. So uh, depends where they are and what the age group, how they search. So really to market to the same way to all of us, it's not necessarily something that money will pay on it. Um, you know, Hispanics are getting to be on the auto industry. They get on the auto industry maybe because they know somebody in the industry and somebody that can show them if there's a, if there's a way to make a career here. Uh, so the referral business, not only to get into the industry, but to buy a car is almost the same thing. It's a referral business to understand how family and friends work and how we help each other uh, to either buy a car or to uh, start a career. Most, most of the Hispanic people that have that work with me are working for me because they knew me or they know one of my employees and, and, and they get a more personal touch on how the industry works. So uh, 
relationship is really critical to our to our race and to our culture. And I, and I think that is what needs to be developed at a local level to either the manufacturers or to the dealers. And that's how it is. Well, putting signs of being Hispanic is nice, but it's uh, in some areas it's offended. So Hispanics don't really believe really in Hispanics. So it's really understanding the local market. That, that's what makes it so difficult to penetrate the market and it becomes more of our relationships uh, between the consumer and the, uh, the manufacturer or the or dealer. Mm. Now, as Hispanic, we look for heroes in our industry or our friends or things like that to tend to follow us for advice. Definitely. And, and Dave, I saw you come off mute. Did you want some comments? Yeah, I would just follow up. I think, uh, Hernan, uh, the, your comments were excellent. And, and Fernando, your follow up as well. The, um, the dialogue, uh, the dialect is incredibly important and it needs to be regionalized. When I ran marketing at Ford, uh, we would run a Spanish ad and it would be the same ad that we would run across the nation. And we try to get all the, the, the ad groups to run it. And, you know, quite frankly, we just didn't have the level of sophistication or want to spend the money to do eight different versions of that that would be regionalized and you need to do that. There's six ethnicities that, that make up 91% of the Hispanic market in the US. It's Mexican, uh, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dom Dominican, Republican, El Salvador, and Colombian. And again, the dialogue and the dialect for each one of those groups is different. They have different slang, they have different connotations of words. But um, today with the data that we have and the fact that we can do programmable media and programmatic media, and we can send specific messages to specific customers in specific regions. Uh, I'm sure Hernan does a lot of this. We can get a lot smarter about how we cut a commercial, how we cut an ad, and how we communicate in a culturally relevant way to each one of these customers in different markets. We didn't have that level of sophistication before. That data is available today, and now we need to leverage that as an industry to continue to expand our footprint, but mostly to make our, our marketing relevant to the consumers uh, in the marketplace. Lisa, I'd love to hear from you and then Hernan. And of course, so not only is it about marketing, but it's also about knowing, for example, um, in my situation where a GM dealer, it's about orders, right? Knowing your client to know exactly what to order, what type of truck, what they like, right? Um, and I think a lot of what's happening as well and something that um, they're missing the mark on is fleet. Um, I believe that Hispanics make up 14% of business owners in the U.S. Um, there's a lot of construction um, contractors, owners out in the U.S. right now that need trucks, that need a fleet. And we're just missing the mark when it comes to marketing to them in that perspective as well. Um, and, you know, as Fernando was saying, in Colorado, you have people from central Mexico. In California, you have people from, um, you know, Sinaloa. In Florida, you have people that are from Cuba and Colombia. So, yeah, it's it depends on your market also to know what to order and what the message is. Yeah. And, and that's back to what I was saying before. Culture is more important than language at time of execution. Language. So, under 10 understand the community you serve, understand the culture, and also understand the cultural differences uh, when Hispanics buying a car compared with the general market. This is something I want to point out. For Hispanic buying a car is an event. They are concerned how they're gonna be treated. They fear the process. It is a family decision. It's our decision. And they see it as an achievement. Uh, they earn it, they work hard for it, they tend to put a high down payment uh, purchasing a car uh, most of the time. And one of the most important things, they value their relationship with the dealership and they're proud. It's a proud celebration. Compared with the general market, which is more a hassle, uh, they expect the service, they know the process. It is a me decision, not a family decision. It's, they see it as a transaction, uh, they feel they deserve it and they minimize the relationship with the retailer. So, Something simple, it's all about how you make them feel. So if somebody goes to the dealership interested in buying a car or a BMW or a Ford track and wants to speak with somebody that speaks Spanish, make sure you have that available for them. That Hispanic salesperson is going to make sure that he has a phenomenal experience at the dealership. And guess what's the first thing this person is going to do? He's gonna take that car, he's gonna go home, 
and show it off to his family members and to his community. So that person, that customer that you treat him with respect, that you make him feel welcome at your dealership is becoming your brand ambassador because he's selling another car on your behalf to his friends and to his community. So when they go back to the dealership, they're going to say, hey, uh, I am the friend of Fernando and I'm coming here to see Fernando that he sold me this great car. So Fernando already knows that car, that sale is already done because I sold that car on that behalf. What Fernando has to do is basically offer me the same experience to my friends that he gave it to me. So this is something to point out is very important. What Hispanics take into consideration on the importance of feel welcome at the dealership. Uh, and again, as I said before, we're shifting from the transactional to the brand experiential. So it's all about how you make them feel and how you keep that consumer engaged and to assure that um, loyalty. They are very, very loyalty, very loyal. And uh, more than 40 percent, uh, they live in a multi-generational home. So imagine how many people your brand could influence by simply making one person happy within that house. That's a question. It's a very good question. <laughs> oh, Fernando, I see you got off mute. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I was kind of thinking about some of the things, that, uh, you know, as Hispanics uh, see as challenge coming to the industry. You know, um, is it an advantage for me to be a Hispanic today in this auto industry um, as it used to be maybe in the past? Um, if I go back 26 years ago when I started the car business, uh, being a minority and uh, this is really how far back uh, this this challenge has been going on. Uh, manufacturers uh, were more willing to spend the money and the resources to, to develop people into the under auto industry. Um, here we go 26 years later, and we're still fighting for the same uh, small piece of pie, uh, um, where we're trying to get into more people into our industry uh, to take advantage of some of the programs. I, I look at the manufacturers today, they, they need to invest in minorities, just like they invest when they're creating a new people. Um, they might spend billions of dollars uh, doing research and development on a vehicle that will never make, make it to the market. But they had to do that to decide if the vehicle was worth it or not. They put the money out there, they spend it. If it pays out, it pays out. If it does, it was part of their investment. The cost to get into our business today is so high that I feel manufacturers need to do the same thing. They need to set aside billions of dollars and says, you know what? We're going to set up these right candidates or these engineers or whatever in our industry and invest in their future and see how we sell more cars to minorities or not. If it works out for them, then it was a good for the industry. If it doesn't, then, then it was an experiment and they can readjust it. But today, we're treated, again, rightful souls just like anybody else. You know, it's a loan that we have to pay back. But that, that entrance point is getting to be almost unreachable for minorities. So what's going to happen five, ten years from now, as minorities get out of the business, you won't have a minority in the business. They can sort of the most part of cannot afford to do it. That's actually interesting. And, and speaking about um, everyone's careers specifically, you know, has being Hispanic, Latinx offered any advantages or, or benefits in your career? I think it has for me initially. It did on a big Hispanic. Obviously, it gave me a, a place at the table. It, it, they gave me an opportunity to do who I am today. Uh, so I'm always thankful that, that, that uh, being a Hispanic, um, you know, the manufacturer recognized that and recognized the need for that, and, and I made it available to me. So it has been um, has been uh, well for me. Um, I do know I can tell people we were the last ones to the table, so they're helping us catch up to be a part of. Part of the mix going forward, just to become more traveling. Yeah, I would say for me, at, at the later part of my career, I'd say the last quartile of the career uh, with an OEM is where the Hispanic uh, heritage and history um, came to life. I kind of hid from it the first 20 years because uh, I wanted to fit in. I needed to be chameleon-like. And um, as I started to embrace it, I started to get very active in the Hispanic community. Uh, I always went to Hispanic MBA Association. I was active with the Hispanic Chamber. Uh, throughout the country. I was active with our Hispanic dealers and our minority dealers. Uh, and and I, uh, I was able to bring a different level of perspective that helped us push into, you know, changing our recruiting uh, strategy to go into Hispanic uh, 
dealerships, trying to get more funding to Fernando's point to be able to help support dealers uh, that are trying to get in the industry. And so, um, and I was able to, you know, do all this on my terms at the later part of the career. Uh, but I felt like I couldn't do that at the beginning. Now things have changed so much. It's a different world today than it was, you know, 40 years ago and 35 years ago when I started in the industry. So, um, which is great. So I think the opportunities are abound for everyone. And, and the most important thing is not to hide from it, to embrace uh, your, your heritage and your community. And it will pay dividends over the long haul. Completely agree. Uh, Lisa, Susan, did you have a? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just wanted to say a thousand percent, yes. <laughs> Yes, it definitely has helped me in my career. Um, you know, and you guys have all heard about being in the right place at the right time. I really feel like I am, uh, you know, it's almost like I've been riding this 23 year long wave. And, you know, I, I, I realized really just in the past couple of years that all of the steps in my career that I've taken have led me to this uh, opportunity to end up in a conversation with you folks, Hispanic leaders. And, um, you know, I just wanted to reiterate how important it is to continue to talk about this because um, Hernan mentioned something that resonated with me and it's celebrating achievement. That's, that's all we want, really, at the end of the day, we, well, First of all, we celebrate everything. I mean, let's face it. I mean, even birthdays are just, you know, <laughs> like from Las Mañanitas at five in the morning to, you know, we love to celebrate, but just buying a car is a celebration. And uh, whether you're Hispanic or non-Hispanic, that's the second biggest purchase we'll make in our lifetime compared to our homes, aside from our homes, right? And, uh, and so we just want to be celebrated and that's the way that you're gonna tr attract us, you know, yes, aside from all of the different dialects at the end of the day, celebrating the consumer's heritage is really what's going to make them want to return to you and come back to you and talk about you. So conversations like this, I think are absolutely necessary to continue to have, um, but absolutely being Hispanic has definitely um, given me lots of opportunities. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like this is just the beginning for folks like us. I think that uh, folks like us are, are needed. And again, we need to continue to have these conversations. Liza? Um, I would say 100%. I mean, I grew up in a Mexican household. <laughs> I mean, I'm used to rejection and no. So I was great in sales. I'm like, you're going to say no to me? Mm, no problem. Right? We're tough. We're tough. We're hardworking and we're very loyal, we're very trustworthy. So it was, it was very natural. It was a very natural transition for me to just fall in place and be able to help um, my customers just because I, I knew what they wanted. I knew what they needed in order for them to get what they, what they wanted. And when it comes from a um, leadership perspective, um, gosh, our priorities are so much different. I think that our, all of our personal circumstances and our personal experiences just growing up Hispanic and know our traditions and our culture make the difference because we're so easy to adapt. Um, and I mean, when it comes to the workforce and employing Hispanics or Latinx, um, I think that's the advantage that you have, that competitive edge that we, we seem to have from, from a very young age. Fantastic. And then, uh, oh, Dave, did you have something else you want to add? I, you know, I, I would just add, I, I like what um, Liza just said. I, I the um, One of the challenges we have, and it's in our, our heritage, our cultural differences, is that Hispanics deep down believe in um, peacemaking. Uh, that, you know, we, we're not, um, we avoid conflict. Uh, and um, I think what's happened is, and I, and I, this is probably the wrong way to say it, but for lack of better words, you know, we haven't been the squeaky wheel uh, with OEMs and in the industry. And I think, you know, I think about that song, Rise Up, and the Hispanics and the associations and the dealers need to take a much stronger stance 
and they have to rise up and they're going to have to demand uh, more resources to help grow the Hispanic footprint. And um, it's with banks like Citibank and Bank of America. They need to be able to support. There's no reason they can't support uh, a loan program for dealers if the OEMs won't do that. The OEMs should be doing that as well and let them finance the blue sky, let them finance some of the stuff that's not traditionally financeable so that the dealers can get in there. And for the OEMs, they should do that and do some kind of, of uh, earn back where you don't have to pay it all back uh, if they're successful, if they sell vehicles, if they grow their market share, if they represent the brand in the way it should be and the, and the brands grow. But we're at a crossroad in the industry now where it's it, if we don't do that, then other brands are going to do that. And those will be the winners. And then the losers are the ones that don't try to expand the footprint. But again, I think it's time for the Hispanic community in the auto space uh, to become a lot more assertive, a lot more vocal and go in with a strategic plan and ask for what uh, they need. Just my opinion. I think a lot of us would agree. <laughs> uh, Hernan. Yeah, no, it definitely helped me 100%. It definitely gave me a profound understanding in how I can help brands and executives in how to, uh, you know, uh, seize one of the greatest sales opportunity next to the general market, which is U.S. Hispanic market. So in the end, it's what I said before, it's about embracing change, embracing that those cultural differences is what make you stronger as a brand, as a consumer. And it's time for, uh, for people in power and executives uh, to pull together and listen, reflect and learn and take action, promoting uh, equality among everybody. Um, these, these new consumers are demanding that. Um, you know, they're demanding more on a level of social responsibility for, uh, for the business they decide to do business with. Um, so it is time for corporate America to create a, a diverse uh, shareholder uh, with an advisory team that will guide you uh, to be successful in this cultural demographic shift. Uh, you must listen to them. Uh, it's not just a quota. It's not just what I see on a daily basis. Oh, X percentage of uh, my employees are Hispanics. Uh, listen to them. Uh, take their advice to heart. Having a mix of people together doesn't guarantee success, but it requires inclusive leadership that assures team members are heard, are valued, and are respected. Um, they also they need to be inspired and have a strong sense of confidence and belonging in your company. Uh, you know, we all share different experiences, no matter we are from Argentina, U.S., uh, Mexico, Puerto Rico. Uh, you name it, but uh, but in the end, um, those experiences and, uh, and we learn from it uh, and we respect those differences is what is going to make you uh, make you stronger. So, uh, my question to executives um, is uh, how they can create a more compassionate, respectful, and inclusive workplace. They they should start asking that. Ask their team members how can we create a more compassionate, respectful, and inclusive workplace. Uh, number two, how are you connecting with multicultural consumers? And how can you improve uh, the communities around you? Uh, so that's on a diversity and inclusion standpoint. As a marketer, you got to be uh, innovative. You got to have a lot of curiosity are crucial to become a great marketer. So innovation and curiosity are crucial to become a great marketer. So push those boundaries. Uh, if you are working in a corporation, challenge the status quo. Just the fact that a company has been doing business or making business decisions a specific way for years doesn't mean it's the right way. Remember that good things never come from comfort zones. Um, if we want success, we must, we must get comfortable being uncomfortable. And, and now more than ever, you have to be relevant. Uh, if not, you will be losing those customers and it, cost, it will cost you even more to get them back. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, conversations like these are, are wonderful. You know, folks listening in and um, having that curiosity to listen in is, is really great. Um, and to to that point, too, I, I also, you know, I see we're, we're kind of getting close to the end of our of our time here, although we could probably 
talk all day. Uh, but I was uh, wanting to ask everybody, we can do around the horn, you know, in terms of um, what would you tell your younger self or others uh, who are interested in automotive, you know, um, and what would you tell them in terms of the, you know, when they're starting their career, words of advice, uh, you know, what, who are your mentors so that, that uh, you know, if you could, uh, what, what would, what would be your answer? Uh, and I'm going to do around the horn. I'll start with Fernando. Uh, I probably always look at my mother being my mentor. You know, my mother was the one that drove and put the energy behind everything I do. So she's always um, a strong person in my life on it. Um, but to somebody getting in the auto industry, I need to tell them it's not about spark plugs and carburetors anymore. Uh, being in the car business is completely different. Uh, it is a good career. It's something that uh, uh, it's right in line with being an engineer, or being a doctor, or being a lawyer on it. Uh, we need to do a better job getting into our industry to be more respectful uh, so more young people can look at it as a serious career. Uh, and from the manufacturing people recruited from school to us, and the dealer level, hiring people and showing them a path to success uh, in the auto industry. And it takes a commitment for us to. Uh, show them that they can make a living and buy a house and you know just like any other career does you know show more respect to our industry but that comes from us and also comes from the manufacturer that there is a there is a better path ahead. love that lisa lisa you're, you're on mute oh sorry no. okay um, well, I think the uh, mentor, right? Mentor, well, gosh, I think all of us will just say, you know, our family, our grandma, our mom, our dad, just because they come from a generation that was so hardworking um, that you didn't really know anything else, right? So in our household, the difference was that we had to go to college. That was not an option, you know? So I would say education is first. That's what I would tell my younger self, like, hey, your parents are telling you to go to college for a reason. Um, and I think that a lot of Hispanics or Latin, they're like, oh gosh, I don't want to go four or five years into school. I don't have time because we have this hurry of making money and growing up and getting married and doing everything that you're supposed to do, right? It's just, it's in our blood to just hurry up and get things done. Um, and I think I could say we're really good at dedicating ourselves to something and working super hard. And this is the one career that if you do do that, you know, you could you could be up there with your doctors and attorneys and lawyers and make that type of income. Um, and I would just, you know, say, keep at it. The best thing that we're good at is relationships. If we want them or not, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of people in our life. So um, this business is a people business. So you already have the, the upper hand on that because you know a lot of people. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> uh, Dave? myself off mute so um i had a number of mentors along the way and you know what, what i learned the most from my mentors is how to listen uh and then not be afraid to take chances uh so you got to put yourself out there I, I think if i was talking to myself today uh or back when i started i i would tell myself that i need to embrace embrace my cultural difference uh our country even back then when i started uh, is incredibly diverse and companies need to know how to best navigate uh, diversity in the marketplace and who better to do that than people that come from those those uh, backgrounds so us coming from hispanic backgrounds african americans coming from their background uh, asians from their background they all understand the cultural differences they understand the the, the language differences but mostly they understand uh, the community and how to embrace that community. And and I would tell myself that uh, if I was starting again today, and I would be much more vocal and much more opinionated about the reason why it's important that we embrace diversity in the company. Well said. Uh, Susan? So I'm going to touch on something that Dave mentioned earlier. If I were to go back and uh, give myself advice as a young Hispanic uh, starting out my profession, I would say don't be embarrassed about showing off your language and your culture and your heritage. Because as he mentioned, I think we all have tried to assimilate, um, especially in the professional 
environment, in a professional environment where we may be that one person, right, out of 50 in the room, and we're trying to be like them. I would say, speak more Spanish, show off your roots, talk about your heritage, but also be a mentor to others who are trying to assimilate. Be a mentor and encourage others uh, to hone in on their Spanish, their roots, because we are, you know, we are the future. As, as, as cheesy as that sounds, we are the future leaders. And our, you know, our wonderful group of, of people are growing and we, we need more Hispanic leaders out there. So again, show off your roots, be proud of who you are, talk about it more, have more conversations, um, but also push others up. I think we could all use a boost. I think we all might know of someone who, you know, you see that 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 twinkle in their eye, but they might be a little bit too embarrassed to come forward because they might feel, uh, you know, like they need to assimilate more into the English language or the English environment. But pull up others, push up others uh, to do the same thing that we're doing. Great advice. And, and Hernan? Yeah, uh, back to what Susan was saying, be, be proud of our heritage. Uh, do never forget where you come from. Um, and also uh, love what you do. Uh, live life with purpose, whatever that purpose is, whether it is working in the automotive industry or something else, uh, with purpose, I strongly believe uh, money comes along. Uh, not the other way around. Um, so love, love what you do. Don't be afraid of uh, making mistakes and failure. As an entrepreneur, Hispanic entrepreneurs, I made a lot of mistakes, but uh, helped me to be where I'm at right now, right? Uh, a, close, uh, a, a, door, a door closed, another one open. So uh, if you don't sacrifice for what you want, in the end, what you want becomes your sacrifice. So embrace change. Uh, don't be afraid of failure. Uh, on the contrary, it gives you a step closer to greatness. That's how I see failure. And um, have purpose and, and just give it 100%. Um, the, the future is very bright. Um, multicultural consumers are driving the growth, which translates to huge business opportunities for automotive industry, car dealerships, and all industries. Um, so it's, it's a great way of uh, been uh, having your business and uh, a great way to assure sustainability and growth uh, moving forward by embracing this demographic shift. Well, those are inspiring words I think we can end on. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. Uh, we know y'all are really, really busy, so we're incredibly grateful that y'all chose to spend some time with us today. Uh, thanks to everyone who's tuned in and joined our conversation. And also thank you, John Foster, for his warm opening remarks and TrueCar for hosting this event. Hope everyone has a wonderful day and a happy and insightful Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.